Hey, uh, Carla G, what, what are you doing with that soap you can't eat, Dad? I thought I would sing some opera today in honor of today's Three Stooges movie, Microphonies. So? So I thought I would eat some grit of soap. But why? So then it will be a soap opera! <laughs> We got a show to do. Soap opera. I don't get it. That was a clean joke. It's three students in a fast lane. With your host, Andy P, who must have bought out somebody to get this job. And Curly G, the grandson of Curly Howard. With our special guest, Frank Gladstone. And special appearances by Kurt Lamond, the great grandson of Larry Fine. And our pal, Chris Dunnick. Only on three students plus. Ah, the voice of spring is in the air. Oh, oh, it feels so good to sing to the wind. All right, all right, all right. Stop, oh, stop, stop, stop. Oh, oh. You stop me from singing? You call that singing? <gasps> How dare you insult me when I come here to help you with your show? What do you mean, come here and help me do my show? Curly G, this is our show, and it's your job to be here. Curly G? I'm not Curly G. I'm Senorita Cucaracha the Third. My grandmother was the original Senorita Cucaracha, who Curly pretended to be in the short Mike Ruffonis. What are you talking about? What are you doing? Have you gone mad? Look at you dressed up, wasting time. This silly wig. Take this wig off. Oh, oh, my hair! My hair! My hair! Andy, what are you doing to our guest? Senorita Cucaracha the Third flew all the way from South America to sing on her show, and you treat her like this? I, I thought she was you! You thought she was me? You moron! How dare you treat me this way! Ooh. I've never been this mistreated in my life! <laughs> Boy, you really upset her! I'm sorry, I, I thought she was you. She looks just like you. I don't see it. I'll ask the cameraman. Hey, Ronnie, does she look like me? Nah. What do you think, Mike? No. Nope. See? Well... I'm just a victim of circumstances. Hey, you can't use that to get out of trouble. Well, it was worth a shot. Well, now what are we going to do to open the show? That's easy. We introduce ourselves. I'm Andy P. And I'm Curly G, the youngest grandson of Curly Howard. And welcome to the Three Stooges in a Fast Lane, where we deep dive into your favorite Three Stooges short, go on a Stooges location, interview a Stooges guest, answer some Stooge fan mail, and present a Three Stooges classic. And today's classic is said to have been one of my great Uncle Mo's favorites, Microphonies, released November 15th, 1945. It was our 87th Columbia Short, and it was written and directed by Ed Burns, who was a longtime Stooge sound man. Now, Burns made his directorial debut with the short they shot prior to this, A Bird in the Head. But prior to filming, Curly had suffered a series of minor strokes, and his health was failing, and he was sluggish and struggled to perform. But Mo, Mo! The decision was made to swap the release dates of these two pictures, as Curly had been much more himself in microphonies, which helped to secure Burns' director position. Now, this short also features the Stooge fan favorite, Christine McIntyre. Christine McIntyre? Woo, woo, woo! What a dame! Dame? Oh! I mean, what a dish? I mean, what an actress! That's better. I'm sorry, Andy. She's just great. I've loved her ever since her Stooge debut in Idle Rumors. And then again in No Doughboys. Okay, and then again in Three Pests and a Mess. And all those Stooge Shemp shorts? Like when she thought Shemp was her cousin Basil. And all those solo Shemp shorts? And all those solo Joe Besser shorts? And all those solo Joe Dorita shorts? She's grand! Yeah, but if you're such a big fan, did you know that she did the actual singing in Microphonies? Of course I did! Oh. But that was uncalled for. In fact, producer Hugh McCollum asked Burns to write a script featuring her singing. And as possible, the voice of the spring song was chosen because she had debuted it in a Soundies musical film. And it also helped hide Curly's weakened voice since he spent most of the time lip syncing instead of actually singing. They actually even used Curly's bad singing voice as part of the gag. Right. Oh. Proud of you. Thank you. I do wish we had some more Curly singing with the Stooges, though. In later years with Curly Joe, they made a bunch of records. Oh, the records I still enjoy. In fact, if you listen carefully, you can hear the wind take the songs down the hall of Stooge headquarters. You hear it? I do. You do? Suddenly. Oh boy, I wish I could see what the record albums look like. Oh, that's easy. Just close your eyes. Close my eyes? You see him? I don't see him. Hmm. How about now? Oh, now I do. While that's Peggy O'Neill. If she walks like a sly little rogue. If 
She talks with a cute little brogue. Sweet personality, full of rascality. That's Peggy O'Neill. Oh, this is so great, and I love anything Stooges, and these albums are so fun. But boy, do I wish we had some records with Curly. Luckily, we have a bit of him singing in the shorts. If you close your eyes, Andy, you can see him. Really? Yes, Andy, close your eyes. Do you see him? No, I don't see him. What about now? Oh! That didn't work. Well, let's just cut the clip. Custard for mine. Oh, oh custard. custard. Sweetly. <laughs> and now everything is all Jake. All it's all Jake. Boy, that's fun stuff. But we still got a lot to do. We got a lot more to talk about. We got our interview. We got locations to go on. We got fan mail. And then we got to introduce the show. Not to mention the commercials. All oh, right, the commercials. I help you shuffle into the commercials with a little song. The voice of spring is in the air. Ah, I bet you were never this happy to ah, cut to a commercial. Ah, 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 ah. And now, folks, we interrupt this commercial break with a very special announcement. Microphonies was chosen by the Alex Film Society to be one of five featured shorts at the Three Stooges 25th Annual Big Screen Event at the Alex Theater in Glendale, California. Oh, woo, woo, woo! Carly G, what are you doing? Quiet, I'm broadcasting! What the? I heard you mention the Alex Theater. I sure did! And did you mention that Microphonies opened a festival that it was chosen to represent one of the best of the best of all Stooges shorts? And did you tell them what the festival was all about? No, I didn't! Why, Curly G, why? Because I ate the script! 
<sighs> Curly G, the Three Stooges big screen event is a big deal for Stooge fans. I mean, some travel from all over the world to watch the Stooges in a packed theater full of fans, projected 35 millimeter film prints right out of the Sony Columbia Library. I mean, this has been going on for 25 years and shows no signs of slowing down. It's a true testament to how popular the boys still are. That sounds amazing, I wanna go. You go every year. No, I wanna go now. I wanna go now and show the fans the Alex. I'm going now, let's go. I better go, he's my ride. Well, hello folks, look at the beautiful Alex Cedar. Hey Andy, what did they do to it? It looks like they're demolishing it. You idiot. Oh! This isn't the Alex Cedar, it's next door. What? It's gonna no! No! Hey, my ear! Now we're in front of the Alex Theater. Opened in 1925 as the Alexander Theater featured vaudeville acts, plays, and silent movies. And for 25 years, this was the home of the Three Stooges big screen event. A very important event in the life of Curly G. Right, Curly G? Money for a poor old stooge? Please. I'll be right back. Money for a poor old stooge? Curly G, what are you doing? I'm trying to raise money so I can go see the show. You don't need to raise money. Your family, they'll let you in the show. That's right. I am family. Ha ha ha. Andy, it looks close. How are we going to get in? You got to use your head. Oh. Oh. Why don't I just open it? Oh, oh boy, the stage. Stage. Curly G, enough singing. We got an interview to do. Now look at this theater. It's got this gorgeous and unique neoclassic Greek and Egyptian architectural elements, along with the lobby that that is got a long courtyard between Sorry. courtyard. Sorry. Between the lobby oh. and a ticket booth which was inspired by Groman's Chinese Theater. Now, why don't you just sit there? Because that seat was too close to the edge. I like being more in the middle. So, Curly G, you and me met because of this event, so we spent our first night here at this theater. And every year now, one of my favorite things is to come here dressed as a Three Stooges with you and Chris and run around and meet everybody. But I'm not the only one you met because of this event and in this theater. No, when I started coming to this event, I actually met my extended family, Shemp's family, for the first time. We're talking Shemp's granddaughters, great-granddaughter. I met Larry's great-grandson, Kurt, here. I also met Saxon Sitka, Emil Sitka's son. This is really what brought the families together. I mean, that would not have happened if it wasn't for the Alex Theater. Hey, what are you two doing in here? Yeah! yeah! a close call. Yeah, but I'm glad we're back because we still have so much to talk about, starting with the Stooges co-stars. Now, in addition to Christine McIntyre, Microphonies features co-star Simona Boniface, who you'll find in many of the Stooges' most memorable shorts. Although sometimes it's just an uncredited party guest, as in a plumbing we will go and an ache in every steak. She could also be found in No Sense is No Feeling, Crash Goes the Hash, Local Boy Makes Good, Spook Louder, G.I. Wanna Home, Half Witch Holiday, Vagabond Loafers, and more. We just don't have time to get to all of them. Wyatt, I'm hosting. Oh! But don't forget, you also got to talk about Gino Corrado, who played the Italian singer. Oh, I was just getting to that. No, let me do it. Corrado's performance was so great and classic, it really solidified him as a Stooge fan favorite. Along with his appearance in Saved by the Bell and an ache in every steak. Don't forget Pardon My Scotch, where he also plays an Italian singer, where the Stooges tried to get him to stop singing by flicking cherries in his mouth. Uh, that's actually not him, but it's a common mistake that some Stooge fans make. That's actually Billy Gilbert, who you might remember from Men in Black. Rats used to come out of that. And he's also the voice of Sneezy in Disney's Snow White. But in part of my scotch made 10 years earlier than Microphonies, he played basically the same type of character in the same situation as Corrado did much later, which was a common practice for the Three Stooges shorts. The difference was how the gags ended, with Billy Gilbert famously getting the banana in his mouth. Yeah, a gag that inspired us to pay homage in a web series we do, Big Baby, where we both get a banana in the mouth. Oh yeah, that's right, we didn't steal it. We paid homage. Good call, Curly G. Thanks. Good call. 
But now I'm going to take another little trip. Not far from here, Stooge fans help honor both Simona Boniface and Gino Carrado by placing markers in their final resting spots. They were both buried in unmarked graves in the same cemetery, and I think we should go pay our respects. Oh boy, can I pay my respects too? I think that's a bad idea. Why? Well, because you're not respectable. Fair enough. Here, play with these Stooge dolls till I get back. Oh boy! Stooge dolls! Hiya, Shampy! Hiya, guys! Hiya, Larry! Hiya, Mo! Hi, Grandpa Curly! Oh! Leave him alone! Why I oughta... <laughs> Simona Boniface was born in New York City, became interested in theater, and began writing and acting for the stage. In 1925, she broke into the pictures at Hot Road Studios, where she appeared alongside Laurel and Hardy, R. Gang, and Charlie Chase, who would later go on to write and produce for the Three Stooges. In 1935, she joined Columbia's Two Real Comedy Division, where she began appearing with the Three Stooges, where their slapstick style was a perfect foil for her upscale dignity. She's really well known for her appearance in Halfwit's Holiday, in which Mo throws a pie up on the ceiling and comes crashing on her face. That footage would later be reused in Pest Man's Wind, Scheming Schemers, Pies and Guys, and the feature compilation, Stop Look and Laugh. You act as though the sword of Damocles is hanging over your head. Her final appearance would be in 1949's TV show pilot, Jerks of All Trades, starring Mo, Larry, and Shemp. So we salute you, Simona, on behalf of all Stooge fans. Thank you for everything. Gino Carrado was born in Italy, has appeared in over 400 films. In fact, he boasts one of the most impressive filmographies of all time. He got his debut in D.W. Griffith's Intolerance, appeared in the silent version of The Ten Commandments and F.W. Murnau's Sunrise. He's the only actor to appear in Citizen Kane, Casablanca, and Gone with the Wind. But he is best known for his role as the Italian singer in Microphone is with the Three Stooges. And for that, Gino, we salute you. Now, while we're here at Valhalla Memorial Park in North Hollywood, I have to pay tribute to Oliver Hardy, one of the greatest comedians who've ever lived, and a man who has had a profound impact on my life. He appeared in the same film as the Three Stooges Hollywood Party, although they were never on screen together, and unfortunately, because that would have been a dream come true. And while we're here, we do have to take a minute to pay our respects to a man who helped keep the Stooges going. Without him, who knows how much Three Stooges content we would have lost. Curly Joe Dorita, the last of the Stooges. Here, see you, buddy boy. Oh, 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 Curly G, you're my favorite nephew. And that Andy P, he's the worst host. He's right, Andy P's the worst. Hey, leave him alone. Andy can't help it, he's a spineless moron. What are you doing, Curly G? Oh, nothing. We're playing with dolls, huh? Wait, these are good. These look really good. Yeah, they have them all dressed up. Uh, from Brightless Groom, from No Senses, No Feeling, from Fueling Around. Andy, they have them from all kinds of the shorts. Oh, they don't have them from microphones uh, with Curly a Senorita Cucaracha? Not yet, but that's a great idea. Sure is, because I use my head, like you should. What? Ow! Now, come on, we gotta get going. We got an interview with Frank Gladstone from the Alex Film Society, and he's here to talk about the Three Stooges big screen event. Oh boy, right Frank! Really? I love Frank Gladstone! Yeah. Uh, I can't wait to go! In fact, I'm going now! I wanna get a good seat! Oh, we we'll get a good seat? Hey, wait a minute! You're not gonna take my seat! Oh, you're not taking my seat! No! What are you doing? I want the middle seat! It's my turn! I had it last time! Ugh. This is Fine. Gonna be a great interview, I'm telling you right now. Oh, guys. all right! <laughs> I got the middle this time. Hi, guys. Frank, it's Andy P. Hello, Andy. This is Curly Frank, G. Frank, Curly G, we know each other. So, Frank, welcome to uh, Three Stooges in the Fast Lane. We're here to talk about Three Stooges and deep dive into microphonies. Yep. Based on your suggestion. So, let's uh, tell our audience a little bit about yourself first. I'm, I'm actually in the animation industry, and I teach at Cal State, and I'm the producer of the Annie Awards, which is kind of like the animation Oscars. Big time. I guess so. So, uh, and obviously the Three Stooges have been put in animation a number of times. They have. The first reference I know about is in a Warner Brothers film, and in it, Bob Clampett, who was the director, suddenly has the Stooges come out in caricature, and they got one body and three heads. And they're going, boo, 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 you know, and, and they're poking each other and doing all that kind of stuff. When I asked the class, do they know who they refer to? Because a lot of those post, those references back then, people don't know about now. They know. They know it's the Stooges. Great. So, 25 years. This is your 25th year of doing the Three Stooges uh, big screen event. It's obviously been a success. Yeah. It's, it is, and I, I, I hope they all feel excited. It's amazing. It's the one show every year 
that we actually know we're going to go in the black. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, these shorts are made in the 30s and 40s. I know. So let's talk about microphonies. You guys pick microphonies. It's the one that I'm leaving the house. I'm going to the stooge meeting. My wife goes, microphonies. So there you go. Okay. And, and that was the one everybody, the first one, we all said, microphonies. Done. It's my favorite short, too. But my wife gave me my marching order. And now Grito's own story of Sandra Sandpile, and here's Mud in Your Eye. Uh, Mo does, is really good when he's the announcer. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, Grito. Grito. He Grito. likes that. Spelled oh. backwards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Grito, spelled sideways, is Atrag. <laughs> How do you even write that? Dopes. As far as microphones goes, it just, it plays to everybody, and, and that's what I love about it. So the audience that comes to the Three Stooges Big Screen event, yeah. it's all ages. Yep. It's, it's not... You know, necessarily people who were kids in the 50s well, watching this on TV. It's interesting. Usually the afternoon audience may be a little larger, but it's partly because there's more kids mm -hmm. there. The nighttime audience, maybe not. But uh, but the nighttime audience has the diehard fans, some of whom come in the afternoon and in the evening. Wow. You're seeing the same show, guys. <laughs> right. yeah. First of all, Sony gives us prints like nobody else gets. They're not going to ship those prints. To, an, to another city or anything like that. They, they give us the prints that they have in the, in the, in the vault. We're, I think we're the only people that, that, can, that can use them on a regular basis. And then you're seeing them projected 35 millimeter as they were projected when they first came out. You'll never see them as, as, as accurately as that. So what do you attribute to the longevity of the Three Stooges? Well, first, first of all, it's slapstick. And slapstick cuts across everything. Everybody thinks somebody's slipping on a banana peel. It's funny, no matter what. The characters are easy to identify with. They were, they were easy to identify with in the, in the day, too, because, again, they were the outliers. They were the, the poor guys, the, the garage mechanics, the guys looking for work, uh, trying to do census taking, you know, whatever they were doing. So you could identify with them. You could identify with them. Most people could identify with them. And I always felt like, as a kid, it's like they had a superiority over the three students. Like... The kids are smarter than the Stooges, and there's something endearing about yeah. that to them. Yeah, well, they, oh, look, they're grown men acting like us. <laughs> <laughs> One of the classic moments in this is when they're taking the cherries and they're flicking them into Gino's, Gino's mouth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. so I, I got a bowl of grapes here, right? And uh, we couldn't oh, find man. yeah, we couldn't find cherries because well, the cherries got stones in them anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh. and they were out of season. Yeah, right. And in the original script, actually, which we have a copy of. Hands really? off. Yeah, in the original script, which we have a copy of, they were grapes. Oh. Okay. So we're going to have Curly G here sing some opera, and you may are going to try to see if we can actually... See if we can do it? Yeah. And if we hit one, can we go... <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy! Yeah. So let's give him a salva. All right, so let's try. I'm going to move my chair here out of the way. And I can use my best opera voice. <laughs> That's your best opera voice? Best me, your more... Bess me a more. Oh, bess me a more. I'm not even kidding him. Bess me a more. You're much better at this than I am. Bess me a more. All right, I'm going to give one last try. Ow! Oh! Slightly! Slightly! That was fun, fellas! Well, Frank, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. We'll see you at the Alex Theater. You're the best. You're the best. And we're going to run around and get kicked out. Now let's introduce the short microphone! Whoa, 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 Curly G, we're not introducing the short yet. We still have some fun stuff for the fans. Why can't we get to the shorts? Because I have something really exciting. Right here is a copy of the original shooting script of Microphonies. And here I hear on page one... Give me that, the original script! Let me see! <laughs> what are you doing? You just ate the script! Anything Three Stooges, I just eat up! Especially when it's rare Three Stooges! Well, now it's even more rare! But luckily, I still have the first page. Now, this is really interesting because the first page of the script is different than the opening of the actual short. And I thought the fans would like to hear how Edward Burns originally intended the beginning of the film to go. Fade in. 
montage of scenes having to do with radio broadcasting, antenna towers, studios, microphones, control rooms, technicians at work. Over this montage, time so that the words bear the proper relation to the scene, we hear the commentator, very dramatic, speaking in exaggerated March of Time style. To the far corners of the earth, the magic of radio brings music, laughter, drama to the world that sorely needs it. And who are these men behind this modern miracle? Engineers, scientists, artists, the humbler workers, well-trained and efficient. His voice changes from dramatic to colloquial. Wait a minute. Th did I say efficient? What goes on here? Interior broadcasting station, medium shot. As the commentator's last few words are heard, we see the Stooges working on a piece of pipe that extends from the wall. A steam radiator, evidently just attached from the pipe, stands near them. The room, which the boys are working, is a small audience gallery, complete with a few rows of chairs for spectators, separated from the broadcasting studio proper by a glass partition. The boys are expanding a great deal of energy, but are getting exactly nowhere. Larry is tugging one way with a big pipe wrench while Curly is pulling directly against him. Mo, yeah. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Lane you Branch. Lane Branch. Can't do anything right, can you? Go on, get around there. That's fun, but they cut out the whole beginning of narration from the actual short. Probably to save on editing time and money for stock footage. That's true. What else is interesting about this script is that Ed Burns had very little stooge on stooge slapstick in it. In fact, there's only three slaps and one head conk, as he actually wasn't that big of a fan of all the violence. But there are some great jokes and visual gags in this short, like Moe and Larry with the gloves that help make this short a classic and even change the stooge humor from this point on. The funny thing is, I've seen this short a dozen times, and I never even noticed the lack of slapstick. Yeah, me neither, but I know there's a bunch of fans out there who are really clamoring to see a bunch of stooge hits, pokes, and punches, and smacks, so I thought we should give them some before the movie begins. How are we gonna do that? Oh, I'll show you. Let's start with an eye poke. Ow! And a face slap. Ow! And we need a new no! And a nose ah! poke. Oh, hey! oh, no. Ow! Ow! Hey, wait a second! What about that? Hit it! Now there's a principle in writing called Chekhov's gun, which asserts that if there's a gun in the scene, it must go off, which leads one to believe that a giant wrench at the beginning of a Three Stooges short would go slightly differently than it actually does. Like how? Well, like one would expect at least for Mo to clob a curly with it, but since he didn't, I thought we'd make up for that. Oh, that thing's huge! Oh, yeah, it is. And it's real! Oh, yeah, it is. Hey, wait! Can't we use this little one? It's cute! Oh! <gasps> that was real, too. All right, well, let's give this one a go, huh? No! Okay, so from 1945, written and directed by Edward Burns, and starring the Three Stooges, Christine McIntyre, Gino Carano, and Simona Boniface. Here's Microphonies. Enjoy. All right, Curly G! Huh? Let's check off gun this thing! <laughs> Brains can't do anything right, can you? Get up over here, come on. Get over there, you come over here. Now, get to work. Just a second. Let me have that wrench. Let me have it, you imbeciles. Oh, 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 oh. Hey, boys, I must be dead. I hear an angel singing. You can say that again. My! Uh, uh, ain't she pretty? Shut up. You said I could! Shut up, we're on the air.
tell you, boss. I was just starting to put the... I know, I know. There's a radiator. And look, there's a piece of pipe. But the radiator ain't no good unless it's connected with the pipe. Not one itty, itty, bitty good. You jackheads! Get busy and finish this job! We ain't got enough stuff. Well, go get it! Here's your recording, Miss Andrews, and very nice, too. Thank you. I'll see that Mrs. Bixby hears this record, and I hope she'll hire you for her program. But I still can't understand why you won't audition for her in person. Mr. Allen, my name isn't really Andrews. It's Van Doren, and I know Mrs. Bixby very well. And so, you see, I couldn't possibly audition for her in person, could I? I don't get it. Well, you see, my father doesn't approve of my being a radio singer, so I have to do it under an assumed name. Well, I follow you so far. Well, if Mrs. Bixby hires me, my father can't object because she's an old family friend. That's simple enough, isn't it? Oh, sure, sure. Simple like radar. Uh -huh. I'll do my best to get the job for you, Miss Sanders. Oh, thank you, Mr. Allen. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mo. It was an accident. I know, fellas. Accidents will happen. Sure. Now you take this wrench. I don't want it. Oh, oh. oh, oh mercy, oh. I did it. Oh. Oh. I'll make Potter on that. Leave alone. Now, let's Come see. On, Tell me what's going on here. Pick up that stuff and get to work. So help me, this your last. Oh. Oh. Skulls, I'm broadcasting. Use Gritto, radio friends. The soap that gives your hands that dishpan look. How will the old man know you've been working if your hands don't have that dishpan look? Hmm? <laughs> Put a box of Gritto in a glass of water, then listen to it fizz. <clears throat> Dopes. Remember, Gritto, spelled sideways, is Atrag. <clears throat> and now Gritto's own story of Sandra Sandpile, and here's mud in your eye. Music. Hark, who is that stepping off the boulevard down by the chicken house? To she. I shall seize her and tie her to the tracks. And she... <laughs> Mrs. Bixby. Good afternoon. I wish to audition a singer. Will you tell Mr. Allen that I'm here? He got word for you to go to Studio B and he will join you there. Very well.
Peter, you were marvelous. I enjoyed your singing so much. I'm Mrs. Bixby. Mr. Allen told me he had a wonderful new personality for my crispy, crunchy program. He was so right. <laughs> it's agreed, then. You work for me. I have the contracts right here. Now, just a minute, lady. I won't haggle. I'll double the amount of money. Well, I don't know. I don't know more money. Did you say money? I remember the stuff. What do we do? What do we sign? Give me those contracts. <clears throat> Should you read a cucaracha? You sign right here. Oh, I just remembered. I'm having a few guests in tonight for a musical party. You must come and sing for them. Oh, well, now, that's a problem. Uh, I'll pay you $500 if you come. $500? Who do we have to moiter? We'll be there with bells on. Splendid. How am I going to sing at the party? The same way as you did here. Oh, what a marvelous voice. Thank you. Not you. Come on, we got to go shopping. you got to look nice at the party. Come on. Good evening, gentlemen. Good, Good evening, evening, Jeeves. Just a minute, we came with a lady. Oh, pardon. Quite a shack, this Bixby joint. Yeah, it reminds me of the reform school. Jeeves, what time do they serve cocktails? <clears throat> so happy to have you here. My dear, would you care to go to the powder room? Oh, no, no, she always looks like that. Oh, well, then come meet my guests. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor of presenting the great artists, Senorita Cucaracha, Senor Mucho, and Senor Gusto. What is it, Alice? Father, I'm sure I know those men. Ah, Senorita, I am thrilled. I'm going to tickle myself. <laughs> hey, look who's here. We better get out of here. If he spots us, we're cooked. Come on. Oh, Mrs. Bixby, I'm so sorry I'm late. I meet some crazy people. They boss my fiddle. They boss my glasses. Mrs. Bixby, you will excuse me. I cannot play my fiddle. I can sing instead, oh? Oh, of course, we should be glad to have you sing, senor. Look at my glasses, all broke. It's a good thing he ain't got his glasses. Maybe he won't know us. Yeah. Come on. I'm sorry about your glasses, senor. Would you care to sing now? Delighted. <laughs> Muslin in on our territory. We gotta do something to stop him. I got it, fellas. Here. That was a shot, boy. If you suck up here, All right, I want some more, please. Once some more, please. I don't need quit. Let's give him a salvo. All we gotta do is knock him dead with your song and we're in. Just be careful of that record. Nothing's gonna happen to it. Well, it might get broke. Not with me handling it. Just be careful. Shut up. <laughs> with me handling a record, nothing happened. Uh -huh. Look what you did. Now we're cooked. No, we ain't. Look, there's a lot of records. You're getting a half a brain in your skull now, huh? Sextet from Lucy. Can you sing it? I can't even say it. Oh, go on. Get set. Say. Do you know Sextet from Lucy? No, it, I wrote it.
Oh, short eyeballs, eh? <clears throat> Senorita's lost a voice. What is it, laryngitis? No, oh, fallen arches. Say, I wonder who double crossed us with that record. I don't know who did, but I want to get out of here. Quiet. You lost your voice. Where? Shut up. Hey, I got a great idea. We better get out of here. Wait. Why did you take my record from the broadcasting station? I wanted that job and you spoiled my chances of getting it. Now, the least thing you can do is to go through with it. I want to prove something to my father. How can we? My voice, I mean your voice is broken. No, it isn't. It's as good as new. Listen. My dear, you were wonderful. You'll sing for us now, won't you? Of course she will, won't you? I'll do that number you did at the broadcasting station this afternoon. Play Voices of Spring. <clears throat> this way, senorita. All set? I was good enough to get a job, Father. And you are, dear. You're still going to sing on my program. Did I say she had a fine voice? As for these imposters... Oh, 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 oh. Let me face her, Eric. Look down. Look down. Oh, oh, oh,
What a great short, and what a great ending. It sure was, and it seems like Edward Burns always tried to wrap up his stooge shorts with little to no loose ends, which is not necessarily common for the stooges. Well, what are we gonna do now, Andy? Well, what do you mean? Don't you know what time it is? Oh yeah, it's time to fan the mail! Uh, not quite. It's time for fan mail. What's the difference? Mail Cole, mail's here, mail for everybody. Not you, fella. All right, let's answer our first question here. From Karen Philpot. If you could travel back in time and appear in a stooge short, which would you choose and what part would you play, assuming the stooges would be playing their own roles? Disorder in the court. And you know why I picked that one? Because it is such a classic. You were in a court, not in Clancy's pool room. Sit down. And of course the stooges are amazing, but if I was gonna pick a role that I could play, which certainly couldn't be the stooges, the bailiff in the famous scene of them in the, the courtroom is one of my favorites. Take off your hat. I'll raise your right hand. I'll place your left hand here. Take off your hat. And in fact, we've actually played around with that when we were doing the live show, and you were Curly and I was the bailiff. Raise your right hand. Put your left hand here. It was so rewarding, just the, the back and forth and hearing the crowd, how excited they got, and his reactions and how angry he was getting and so frustrated uh, when he takes, the, when Curly gives him the cane and we, he puts the hat on it. I just thought that, Will you get rid of that hat? It was a timeless role for a supporting actor and I really enjoyed playing that part so that would have been one of my favorite roles to play. The part I'd love to have played is Richard Fist's part in Boobs and Arms. What do you guys think you're doing? Playing Hibbity Hop at the barber shop? Where he plays the husband and then the drill sergeant. And you throw everything you have into it. One, because he's he's throughout the whole shore and he's got a lot of fun stuff. He gets angry. I love when he's like, everything happens to me. Everything happens to me. <laughs> and was he in any, any other uh, stooge short? Yeah, yeah, he did a couple. He was in Sweet Pie and Pie, and Oily to Bed, Oily to Rise, Three Sappy People, You Nazi Spy. Unfortunately, he died very young. Yeah. Uh, fighting in the war in action. All right, your turn. Hey, this one's f for me to open. Yeah. It's mine, Andy. Oh, it is important. First class. From Kurt Kurt. How old were you when you fully realized the legacy of the Stooges? And when did it hit you that your grandfather and family were legends? As far as realizing it, I actually realized it when I was actually told for the first time, which wasn't until I believe I was six and my brother was 10, which is a story in itself that we didn't find out till later. And then finding out that your heroes are now your family, that's when I fully realized it because the next day my life had changed, but only in the retrospect of when I watched The Stooges, because I didn't tell anybody because no one would believe me, right? That that was our family now. So it changed a little bit in that respect. But as far as the carrying on the legacy and really embracing this, the fans and embracing the fact that, wow, my chances of being Curly's grandson is like one in a zillion, right? Is when I started going to the Three Stooge events and you know, having fans come in from all over the world and just thanking me for being there and, 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 and me, them almost like I was a star or something, which I'm certainly not, but they were like shaking and I'm like, just like, come over here and let me give you a hug. Thank you for, for what you do. And that really is what started uh, this, this whole legacy that we're, we're keeping on and, and what we do here and the stuff that we do online um, is just, uh, it's, it's been a complete honor and a privilege to carry on this legacy and be a part of the family of the Three Stooges. And you know what, since that one doesn't really apply to me and it's from Kurt Kurt, we should send this to our very own Kurt, Kurt Lamond, who's the great grandson of Larry Fine, who's over at Shop Knuckleheads right now. Let's send this over to him. That's a great idea. And let's let him answer. No, 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 you don't have to throw it. <laughs> Sorry, Kurt. I got the question. <laughs> Thank you. So great question. I would say I was about 15 years old in 1989 when the Big Three Stooges convention came here to Burbank, California, and I got a first-hand look at what this legacy is all about. You know, before then I was a kid and I understood it somewhat, but when I saw all these fans and all these people and Michael Jackson at the convention throwing pies, it hit me hard. Literally, a pie hit me hard too.
So I really realized then at 15 that this is a massive thing and I've done my best to, to carry the legacy forward because I'm just as much a fan as anybody else. But I do understand that we have a small responsibility in making sure it stays alive and keeping the laughter alive. And we do our best in this show and all the other things we do. So thank you. Great question. Check us out at Shop Knuckleheads and keep the laughter alive. All right, next question to Curly G from Tom Woodsman in Newburgh, New York. If given the opportunity, would you have actually wanted to be a stooge? Like when they were the Stooges, absolutely not because they're brilliant and they're comedic geniuses. And let's say that I had the privilege to be a Stooge with a family member. Um, I certainly would choose great uncle Mo. You look at Mo who kept going even when Larry was, couldn't do it anymore. And he, he was going to have Emil Sitka play the middle stooge, right? And then he even gave Curly Joe permission to carry on a form of the stooges after he couldn't perform. So Mo would have kept going. And if he did, would you wanted to have been part of it? Um, I just think that bond between nephew and uncle is something very special. And because I love the physicalness of the comedy that we do in the slapstick, I think him and I would hit it off really well. And I would be like, Great Uncle Mo, you can hit me as hard as you want. I think he would be like thrilled, like, oh, that's that's my boy, right? In some of the web series stuff we do and, and some of the stuff that we do online, I play Curly G and Chris Dermick, who's our Mo, plays Great Uncle Mo and the bonding that we do and the, the way it, it just feels so natural. I think that that's the, the connection that I would have would be to play Curly G with Great Uncle Mo. So basically since it really ended with Mo. If Mo had kept going and he was an old man now and still wanted to do it with you, that's that's kind of what you're envisioning, how it would be? Exactly. You know, Curly G, you remind me of your grandfather. I do? Yeah, he's a moron too. Oh, hey, that's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. Shut up. Oh, ah, woo, woo. It's like a trip off the old blockhead. <laughs> Shut up. It's three o'clock. I must be going crazy. All day long, I keep getting different answers. Oh, is that so? Yeah. What time do you want it to be? Five. Here's five. Oh, I should have said two. Yeah, here's two. No. Curly G, we're a social media sensation. Yes. People love us. Yes, yes. But only when I hit you. No. Yes, yes. Oh, see? All right, and that wraps up today's segment of the mail. Hey, wait a second. Can't we just do one more? Uh, we can't, Curly G. We're out of time. No, one more, please, Andy. The fans want to read one more. All right, one more. This one is from Professor Dunkfeather. Who threw those pies? <laughs> Cut the commercial. Folks, that's our show, and I'd like to thank our handsome cameraman, and our handsome sound guy, and our absolutely gorgeous Senorita Cucaracha, the third. And I'd like to thank the bosses down at Stooge HQ and C3 Entertainment for letting me buy this really expensive wrench for this episode. They let you buy that big giant heavy wrench just to beat me with? They sure did. Well, they must like me. But they do. In fact, they said I could give it to you. They did? Oh, yeah. And boy, am I going to give it to you. Wait a second. <laughs> I don't like that look. Hey, folks. Um, I think I got to go. We'll see you next time on Three Stitches in the Fast Lane. If I'm still here, I got to go. Bye. Come back, girly G. Good night from the Three Stooges. Sleep tight, kids. <laughs>